All right, thanks everyone for joining us today for this road, road show session virtually. Um, we're glad that you all could make it. I'm Danielle Sands, I'm with the State 4-H office. And today we have Professor Richard Royals from Purdue Polytechnic. And um, Data, can you say your last name for me? <laughs> hey, yeah, right. My name is uh, Dr. Sherigar. Um, I'm ethnic, so my name's hard to pronounce, but it's fine. Just call me Data, that's okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then um, to start us off, we have Rebecca. She is with uh, the State Junior Leader Council, and she's going to lead us with an icebreaker activity. Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Kleesner. Um, and just to start, would you like me to stick with the timeline so we'll end at 945? Um, you can. Okay. That would be fine. Right. If, unless if you, go, if you go over, that's okay, too. If you run okay. over, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this game, we can make it any uh, time limit. So we're going to be playing Two Truths and a Dream. So how that's going to work, if you've ever played Two Truths and a Lie, it's kind of like that. So you're going to say three things about yourself. Two of them are going to be true, and one is going to be a dream. And so you can say those in any order. And then after you are done speaking, everybody will chat which one they think is your dream. So um, how this is gonna work is you're gonna put a one, a two, or a three. So if you think that the first thing they said is a dream, you'll put a one. If you think the second thing they said is a dream, you'll put two and the same goes for three. So whoever would like to start, if you can raise your virtual hand and say three things about yourself. If not, I can start too, just to get the ball rolling. Okay, I can start. So I'm going to say three things about myself. Um, I've traveled to Japan. I've been to a Reba McIntyre concert. And I will be double majoring in college. So if you guys want to put a number in the chat for which one you think is my dream, after everyone's guess, I will reveal it. Okay, so we've got some guesses. Uh, my second one was actually my dream. I love Reba, so I've always wanted to go to a Reba McIntyre concert. So if there's anyone who would like to go next, you can just raise your virtual hand. Cordell or Cora, do you wanna join us in the activity? Okay, we've got one volunteer. Richard, would you like to go? Sure, I'll go. So my uh, my three things. Number one, um, um, love to go to the furthest point from the center of the earth. I mean, just to uh, experience uh, extreme height. Um, I would love to be voted the ugliest man on campus at Purdue. And um on uh, um i would um um oh let me see um i got them out of order um uh, but uh, um and i would um like to go to uh, space okay that's an easy one um but it's true, I have been to the, uh, I've already been to the uh, furthest point from the center of the earth, which is not Mount Everest, actually. Um, it's uh, uh, Chimborazo, a mountain in Ecuador, because the earth bulges at the equator and Ecuador is on the equator. And so that's a mountain that's actually further from the center uh, of the earth than, than Everest, actually. Um, and I was voted second ugliest man on campus. Um, so, yeah, oh well. <laughs> well, thank you. Would anyone else like to go? Charity event. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, I've been to Costa Rica. I've been 
to Alaska four times and I farm 10,000 acres. Okay, so the last one was the dream. We only farm a thousand acres, but 10,000 seems awesome. <laughs> um, but I have been to Costa Rica um, and then our, our like love, we love to vacation in Alaska. So we try to go there every couple of years. Wow, that's great. I've yeah. had some, uh, really fun trips to Alaska myself. Oh. <laughs> I bicycle camped in Denali during the shoulder season, which was awesome wow. um, because nobody else is in the park except the rangers as they're opening it up. And Isn't that nothing, amazing? But the uh, grizzlies and the, and the wolves. <laughs> yes. I've always wanted to do the lottery to be able to drive through it. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah. But, but it's usually in the fall when you can do that. So um, that's when harvest is. So we can't really, <laughs> can't really do that. <laughs> Cora or Cordell or Dada, what do you think? Um, sure, I can think up of a few stuff. Okay, so three things, one's a dream. Uh, I've been to every continent except for Antarctica, obviously. Um, I've been to every state in India and I can speak five languages. Interesting. Yeah, the dream is um, I, I, I want to speak five languages. That's the thing. <laughs> I, I thought you could. No, I can't. I'm not that skilled. <laughs> I can speak three languages. I want to speak uh, like two more so I can be like very linguistic. That's awesome. Cora and Cordell, Cordell come on. I have two steers and I have my own room and I'm getting a dog. What was the first one? I have two steers, cows, ah. but boys. Okay, so we have some guesses. Would you like to reveal your dream? I share a room with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have known that having four daughters. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> okay, so my two uh, truths and one's a dream would be uh, I live on a farm. I've uh, been to Hawaii, and I have uh, a dog and five cats. Yeah, I've never been to Hawaii, but I've been to different countries around the world, so. Awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for leading this activity for us. No problem. And just so you guys know, this activity can be led at any 4-H meetings. You can do it virtually like I did, or you can do it in person. Uh, so you guys are free to use it. Thanks for having me. No problem. Will we see you later today? Uh, not that I was told, but... Oh, okay. That's fine. Okay. That's totally fine. I just didn't know if we should look for you later, but have a great day. We sincerely appreciate it. You too. I'm so sorry I couldn't stay longer. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye-bye. All right. Well, the floor is yours. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Danielle. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and... Share. Oh, let me make sure I share the right screen here so that uh, uh, oops.
I'm going to swap my displays just because I'm going to do this. Yeah, I got two different displays here. And let me get to the other one. Try this again. Okay. Now. Okay. Now make sure this one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's still. Can you guys see that? Okay. I guess it's on the vertical screen now, which may give you a funny view. We can't see anything. See oh. it? No. How about that? Sorry. There yep. We go. Nope. That works. Is that okay? Is that yeah. uh, that's uh, the vertical one, but that's okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the future of food um, around below and away from uh, crops. But uh, at the same time, uh, first I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and and uh, um, because uh, first I want to say I am not an animal scientist. Uh, I'm an engineer and computer scientist. Um, and um, um, actually, I'm a, I'm a, um, because I study robotics, I've studied electrical engineering, I've studied mechanical engineering, and I've studied computer scientists. Uh, computer science. Um, but, um, you know, again, I, like I said, I'm, I'm not an animal scientist. I work with animal scientists. Um, and so, uh, um, in fact, I'm, I'm leading a class uh, this coming fall where we're bringing together animal scientists and engineering scientists to actually discuss things like the future of um, of uh, farming. In particular, we're interested in um, animal farming. Um, so one of the things that I work with is uh, um, dairy scientists in, in particular. We work with cows, partly because cows are large animals, and uh, that gives us more room to put things like sensors and even robots inside the animals. Um, because, you know, we're getting more and more, our farms have grown much bigger and bigger um, over the last several decades, but um, they still really haven't changed that that uh, um, um, as much as they've grown, they haven't grown in employment as much. So the number of workers on a farm um, is uh, much smaller compared to the ratio in terms of the ratio of workers to, to animals, which is the same as crops. Um, the worker to crop ratio is uh, going down, 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 um, as is uh, the worker to animal ratio on, in animal farming. Um, and so that's one thing I'm really interested in is, is looking at bringing back, um, you know, when I was your age, you know, I had friends, I did not grow up on a farm, uh, but I had friends who did and, and, uh, uh, and I had uh, uh, family members that uh, uh, lived on farms, uh, because I grew up here in Indiana. Um, but um, back then, I remember um, from my school days, um, a friend of mine, a, a very close friend of mine, um, um, talked about um, a prized milker called Rosebud uh, 23. Um, and uh, the point is that uh, when I was growing up, the size of farms really allowed um, individual attention to animals. And it was not uncommon for, um, for farmers to know, literally have names um, for all the, the um, animals on their farm. Um, and to be able to give them that individual attention. And as farms have grown to some of our 10, 20, and even 30,000 head of cattle, for example, and billions of chickens in the United States alone, um, that uh, you can't possibly, no human being can possibly keep track of all those individual animals. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm really interested in is working with animal scientists to kind of bring back that individualized attention. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I do and how we got to that point. Um, but first, let's talk um, a little bit. Uh, um, but again, let me start by talking about, you know, again, who I am and what I've come from. 
And uh, what I've done with this electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer engineering work um, that is, is basically what I call robotics. Um, and and uh, this combination of those, of those three things, which is sensing um, um, mechanisms and, and then computer control. Um, so I've done these, I got these three degrees and my, my bachelor's in electrical engineering, my master's was in mechanical engineering, um, and my PhD was actually in robotics from the School of Computer Science. Um, and I've, I've done that kind of all over the country. Um, I got my bachelor's here at Purdue um, way back in the 1980s. And uh, later that decade, I went out to Stanford out in California, and that's where I got my master's. And then I moved back to Pittsburgh in, in Pennsylvania um, to get my, uh, my PhD. And I've, uh, <clears throat> I've worked in industry. I've worked up in, in New York. I've worked in Minnesota. Um, I've lived in Denver and, and Washington, D.C. I've worked with the government. I've started companies. Um, and, uh, um, and recently, I came back to Indiana, again, where I was born and raised, it was in Indianapolis, um, to uh, be here in West Lafayette at, at uh, Purdue. And, uh, and all along, <clears throat> those experiences and, and uh, um, projects that I've done, um, again, in, in building mechanisms, in flyable robots, in robots for factories, in uh, crawling robots for search and rescue. Um, you know, I've gotten more and more interested in this, this um, situation or, or the, the environment for, uh, for the family farm. And, uh, and that's what brought me uh, here to the 4-H group uh, to talk to you guys about uh, um, what it is. So, so we just had that kind of uh, um, icebreaker activity um, to, uh, to get to know each other a little bit. Um, let me talk to you guys and ask, I also want to know a little bit about what you think of what a robot is. Um, and so, uh, Cora and Cordell, uh, what, what, uh, what do you guys think of when you heard the, hear the word robot? Cora, what do you think? Um, something like maybe a 3D printer or something on an assembly line. Yeah, those are good examples. Cordell? I think of like, uh, helps uh, make stuff a heck of a lot faster than what us humans can do. They're, they can stay on task and do a lot better than we can. Yeah. Um, okay, those are good. Um, let me go for let's let's look at what, at what the dictionary says a robot is because yeah it's kind of hard to define it those are some good examples um, and uh, but but those are uh, the question is what is what do we use how do we define what a robot is and and sometimes what a robot isn't um, you know according to the World Wide Webster's it's a, a mechanism guided by automatic controls well okay that's defines a robot, it defines a lot of things. Um, but there are actually three definitions um, that often appear in the dictionary, right? A device that automatically performs complicated, often repetitive tasks. Well, okay, yeah, that, that fits exactly the examples you guys gave. Um, and it uh, is, is yet another definition. Um, this is an interesting definition. Um, also from, uh, again, one of those three definitions from the dictionary, a machine that looks like a human being performs various complex acts, such as walking or talking, of a human being, also a similar but fictional machine whose lack of capacity for human emotions is often emphasized. Um, yeah, because, you know, we think of the robot dance, you know, we think of what is a robot and, and uh, yeah, often we do think of that, that lack of capacity for human emotions as one of those things that kind of defines a robot. But based on, on those definitions, is this a robot? What do you guys think? It's a dishwasher. Is a dishwasher a robot? Cordell? I mean, yeah. It 
came because back way in the day, they used to just all do it by hand. Yeah, it's certainly doing a complex act that a human being would do. I mean, if anybody's washed the dishes by hand, yeah, they know that's kind of complex. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a mechanism guided by automatic controls. You turn the knob, you set it, and it does its thing. But often we don't really, I mean, technically it fits that definition, but often we don't think of that as a robot, though. I mean, it's, yeah, okay, we don't think, yeah, it's, it's a specialized machine. And what this machine lacks is reprogrammability, right? It can only clean dishes. Right. And, you know, we've put in, I'm sure you've done this before, is if you've used a dishwasher, you've probably loaded dishes wrong and end up with dirty dishes at the end. Right. Have you ever experienced that? It's like, wait a minute. How did that happen? Yeah. Danielle says, I, I get on my wife for doing that all the time. Right. And yeah, if it turns out that, and that doesn't happen with a person, if you get some stuck on grease or gunk or, or something, and you know, you wash and you wash both sides, you know, and you keep washing if you need, if it, if it cleans easy. Right. Well, okay. You kind of adjust yourself. And the dishwasher doesn't really do that. Yes. It does have some sensors that kind of measures the dirt in the water. So it does get a sense now with modern dishwashers. But this dishwasher I have a picture of, you know, that just ran through its cycle. Um, and uh, the, only temp the only sensor it has was temperature sensor. So we could tell if the cold water, if the hot water wasn't on. Um, how about now? Is this any more of a robot? And we talk about this emotions and how lack or whatever I said, but what about this guy? And we can agree that this is a robot, right? Everyone recognize this, I hope. Cordell and Cora, you guys still recognize this guy, right? Who is it? Is a droid different from a robot? Ah, excellent question. Generally not. An android is just a special kind of robot that's made to look like a human. So, yep, that is C-3PO, of course, from Star Wars. And even though we know that there was really a person inside a suit, um, you know, well, that's definitely something we'd call a robot. And that's different. C-3PO can certainly wash dishes, right? But he can also do other things, right? He can help R2-D2, uh, you know, navigate and walk, right? He can, uh, you know, use a, a laser blaster if needed. Um, and again, he's reprogrammable, um, which is an important aspect of robots. What about this guy? I see a mechanism. I see a hand for grasping things. But it's connected to a human. Is that whole thing a robot? Is the arm a robot? Is the arm a prosthetic? Is this a cyborg? Um, right? What is this? Right? And things like this are harder to define. Um, and, uh, and this is what makes robots really interesting and I think exciting um, to, uh, and, and actually has been for literally millennia. Can you imagine when the first person thought of something like a robot? When do you think that was? 10 years ago? 100 years ago? 1,000 years ago? When do you guys think? What do you think, Cora? 400. 400 years ago, back in the, the 1600s. That would have been the time of Galileo, you know, with his telescope. Yeah, they were thinking about robots then. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher, okay? Lived before the common era, right? BC, in 300 BC. While he never used the word robot, Aristotle talked about this fascination with replicating man. And his writings are the first known writings where humans um, 
actually considered the idea of creating basically a robot. You know, what if we had things that could replicate humans? Um, now, of course, Aristotle didn't have access to computers and didn't even really have access to many mechanisms. And, and, you know, the whole field of engineering didn't really exist. I mean, he was considered a philosopher, not a scientist. Um, and his theories were dealt with logic in what we call metaphysics, but it really deals with what we call the theory of what he called the theory of soul. And what we often refer to now as the theory of mind. Um, and one of his famous quotes was, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And that's how he kind of talked about things around this is that, um, you know, humans are so complex, right? That if you look at the individual pieces, you know, insects and animals, they can do much of what humans do. But what we see in the biological world is this growing sense of complexity that when you put things together, when you add parts together, you end up, you can end up with more than just the sum of the individual parts. Um, and that was kind of what he started thinking about in this sense. Um, how about the word robot? Do you know when the word robot came about or how it came about? How old do you think the word robot is? Cordell? Take a guess. Probably a few thousand years old. Wow. Yeah, the idea at least. The word robot is actually only about 100 years old. Um, it actually came from a play 100 years ago um, this year. Um, there was a, a Czech author by the name of Carol Kapek, right, who created uh, a robot or a play called Rossum's Universal Robots. And guess what the plot is? Anybody have an idea what the plot of this movie of this? I'm sorry, a play. This was before movies, right? Um, the play was Rossum's Universal Robots. Any guess is what the theme was? What's the modern, modern theme in robot movies? Have you guys seen Terminator? I wanna take a guess, but I don't wanna be wrong. But oh, just on. looking from the picture, it just um, makes me think of like a bunch of people performing synchronous moves that um, look like a robot like maybe war or a military theme, something along those lines. Yeah. Have you guys seen the Terminator movies? Those are older movies now. I always have to ask because, you know, since they're older movies, you guys might not have seen them. But have you, you guys seen the Terminator movies with Schwarzenegger, Corey and Cordell? No. Nope. How about you, Cordell? I've seen a few of them, but not all. Okay. Um, um, and of course, Transformers is a little bit more recent. Um, a recurring theme in robot science fiction is what? Robots taking over. Well, the very first use of the word robot for this play was exactly that. What if the robots got smarter than humans and took over? And in fact, in Carl Capek's play from 1921, a hundred years ago, this is before movies, right? Sure enough, the robots took over. And in fact, in it, the, the um, RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots is kind of a dark play because the robots end up killing their creator and taking over and, and forcing humans to work in the factories. And, and uh, so it's kind of a dark, but again, it's that theme that we've seen often over and over again is 
in Terminator and even some of the Lost in Space and, and uh, uh, many of these scenes of, of, uh, of, of theatrical productions around robots are about doomsday scenarios, about robots getting too smart. Um, and even, you know, there's not clear if Aristotle even thought of this, uh, you know, 2000 years ago. Um, or 2,300 years ago, um, but clearly those were some of the things he was considering in his theory of mind was, could, what about these kind of different levels of intelligence? Anyway, um, so robots actually first appeared physically. I sh I'm, I'm going to also point out that the very first movie, Metropolis, um, was also about robots. Um, and so this is a play, right, uh, from 1921. Uh, Metropolis came out in 28, I believe, um, as the first movie. It featured a robot. And, um, and so, and again, people like, you know, philosophers, uh, you know, thousands of years ago were thinking of this replication of human beings. And, and this has just been a topic that has fascinated humans for literally millennia. Um, and robots themselves didn't actually appear until um, the 1950s. Um, and uh, the first um, factory robot, and, and you've probably seen some pictures like this um, in the, the lower right, which has, this is a classic automobile final assembly where we have these robots with their big sparks are flying as they're doing spot welding to create a car body. Um, and, and we envisioned back in the 70s and 80s, as robots became more and more popular and, and capable, that we would soon have lights out factories with these robots do, doing all the dull, dirty, dangerous tasks um, and that humans didn't want to do or that were too dangerous for humans. And that eventually these factories would just run themselves. That's why we called them lights out because they wouldn't require any humans except for occasionally some maintenance people to go in and either uh, reprogram the robots or oil them or fix, fix broken uh, parts and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the, the fact is, yep, yeah, these were not only dull, dirty, dangerous tasks, but they were dull, dirty, dangerous robots. Um, and if you look at the, the picture on the left, right, we, we often had to, and still do, we separate the robots from humans because in fact, the robots themselves are so dangerous. And the reason they're dangerous is, is the same reason that the dishwasher doesn't often, often doesn't get the dishes clean, is they're just not that smart. Um, we don't have good robots today that can really cross the street effectively. Um, something that is that we learn as kids, very young kids, right? How to look both ways and plan when to cross so you don't get hurt. Um, doing that with a, with a robot requires pretty specialized tasks. And a key thing is once a child learns to do that, pretty much they've learned it in any street in the whole world. Um, Data knows about India and those streets can be really dangerous, but still you can, you, if you've learned uh, how to cross the street in the United States as a kid, um, eventually, yeah, it's a little bit more dangerous in India in many cases, but, but you can still do it. Um, our robots generally have to be trained on individual streets and stuff like that. Um, and so that's, there's a real gap in the perception of robots, because like I said, we've been taught, we've been thinking about this as humans for thousands of years, but robots have really only existed for a few decades. Um, and so they're still very primitive compared to what came before Robots 1.0. And that was Hollywood and Metropolis and Carol Capek's um, um, Rossum's Universal Robots, right? These are the robots, at least that I think of. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know these robots. You probably know R2, R2D2, right? How many of these, of these robots? Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six robots. How many of these can you guys name? Cora? Oh, R2D2 and, and Wally. And Wally, yes. All right. 
How about Rosie? Does anybody know Rosie? All right, Danielle knows Rosie and, and Data. Cordell, do you know Rosie? No. Oh, don't know Rosie the robot. She was a maid, she was a sassy maid robot. Um, you know, she could talk back to her owners, um, which is what made Rosie so famous. Um, and Data is from Starship. That's a different data. It's I'm sorry. Data and Dada <laughs> um, is uh, a different data, but uh, that's uh, an android from uh, Starship. And the one in the middle, that's from a 1950s sci-fi flick, which had a remake, Lost in Space. Um, there was a remake movie uh, not too long ago. But anyway, um, the point is, is we have been watching robots like these um, in movies and that gives us a false sense of what robots can do, right? Because whether it's a cartoon or it's an animated um, um, person like, like C-3PO or even R2-D2, there was a person inside R2-D2. Um, and, uh, and so these things really create this image. And you can obviously see from the, the 1950s robot Lost in Space, um, that, um, you know, that's probably a human inside there, right? Um, so yeah, we're kind of been, been lulled into this false sense of, of uh, what robots and artificial intelligence or AI can do. Um, but, uh, and of course I mentioned Terminator, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this little clip um, because if you haven't seen it, this, I think, is really, uh, this was uh, the second of the Terminator movie when um, um, it was, the, the robot um, evolved to be made of liquid metal. Um, and so in this case, the robot can literally pour itself into different shapes and, and assume different shapes to create tools. And so this is kind of a, um, a fantasy of mine. This is what I would love to be able to create robots. Imagine this in a search and rescue situation where we could just pour a robot down into, you know, we have, if, if you've been watching the news and you've seen in Miami uh, and Surfside, Florida, you know, this condo collapse. Um, and, you know, there are over 100 people missing. And that's one of the areas I work on is, is search and rescue robots, is building robots. Imagine if we could just pour liquid metal down into, um, into, the, uh, um, into the, the rubble, right? And then just search for people and, 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 and find them, right? I mean, that is, is one of the challenges of getting into these highly uh, um, rubbled environments. Um, but we don't have that. Um, and that's one of the things we're working on is creating plastic versions uh, of these pourable kind of robots. And, uh, but we're, uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, and whoops, let me get past that. And uh, again, the, the idea of a made robot and, and robots that help people, if you notice in all of these examples, um, these robots didn't build cars, right? They didn't work in a factory. Um, you know, C-3PO, does anyone know C-3PO's job? What was C-3PO's title? Translator. Yeah, translator, protocol droid, right? You know, Dada's talking about five languages. C-3PO, I think, knew 500, no, 300, 380 languages or something like that. Six million. Oh, up to six million. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, that was C-3PO's job was to interface and translate between humans. C-3PO didn't do dishes. C-3PO wasn't a warrior robot. Um, and, uh, you know, R2-D2, of course, was more of a repair and maintenance droid. Rosie, of course, I mentioned was a maid. Um, Wally also was kind of like a maid. He cleaned up. He was a recycling robot. Um, all these robots, including Data, um, or Data in this case, uh, <laughs> Commander Data, you know, they helped their humans. So assistive robots 
has uh, uh, is what you know we've gone from from robotics 0.1 this Hollywood fantasy that's existed for thousands of years we finally got robots 1.0 um, in the 1950s and we're just now getting to the stage where we're building robots that help humans rather than again the lights out factory which was replacing them in certain jobs we're finally getting to this the early points of this Hollywood stage where robots are helping humans in the jobs they want to get done. Um, so let me go back. And that's what this Rosie the robot, and this is actually named Rosie, um, which was an acronym. This was a robot that, that helped um, the Chernobyl disaster. And so this was kind of an early time when in Three Mile Island, there was a similar robot uh, Three Mile Island was a, uh, a nuclear disaster here in the United States uh, way back in the 1970s, um, where <clears throat> there was a, a partial meltdown um, due to a, uh, uh, a problem with the control panel. And um, the, uh, we didn't know it at the time, what, how bad it really was, but uh, we used robots because, because there was a, a leak of radiation and a uh, leak of water and there was some damage and you know we had to send in it was, it was too dangerous for humans to go in there so we had to send in uh, um, a robot in this case there was actually an explosion of the entire um, facility um, in the 1980s in russia in chernobyl um, and you can see what's left of the there, there used to be a building there in that hole um, and, uh, and that was uh, the nuclear power plant. And, and of course, there's a lot of rubble and, and this was designed to go uh, again and help humans, not to replace them, but to extend into those dangerous radiation areas. Um, and uh, so, so what I talk about in this, the, the what really makes a robot and how we define what a robot is, is it's a combination of perception cognition and manipulation. Um, those are the things that really provide um, this ability to sense the world, that it must be able to react to those sensations and do so in an intelligent and reprogrammable manner. And then it has to actually affect the world. So it has to do something in the world. Um, and that's what these robots do. Um, but there's this two distinct pieces um, that, that these robots have the ability to do is one, they move around. Notice the, the uh, mechanical Rosie here in the middle has wheels down here, okay? So it can drive around. Um, Rosie, the, uh, that's the mechanical Rosie, the cartoon Rosie, look, she also has wheels, okay? Again, to get around, because that's a key aspect of, of robots and, and, and what we do as humans, if you're working with humans. And then the other thing is manipulation. Um, and that's the ability to pick things up. And we see this mechanical Rosie, yep, has an arm. And this looks more like a crane. It's kind of like an engine hoist um, that can pick things up. Um, Rosie, the cartoon robot, you know, she actually had grippers and she could pick up plates and and uh, uh, Rosie in the cartoon actually has an opposable thumb, which we know that's kind of important. Primates have opposable thumbs like humans and, and monkeys, and, and they're much more adept than, say, a crow, um, which just has a claw. Um, <clears throat> but but those are, are really two classes of robots we talk about, robots that can just move around. And an example on the farm is a drone, okay? We have UAVs, aerial robots that can help us map. Again, this is about helping humans map the farm if we're doing crops. And that's just locomotion. All it can do is move a sensor around. And we normally use just that, a camera, to take pictures of crops, but the robot is great because it can fly around, uh, you know, potentially 10,000 acres, as Danielle said, right? This could be a 10,000 acre farm. It can very quickly fly over and take pictures all over the place. Um, and it can be automated. With GPS, we can automate a UAV, what we call an unmanned aerial vehicle for UAV, <clears throat> a drone, <clears throat> pardon me, 
Um, again, to do that, to do that mapping, to grab information from the sky and then translate that to commands on the ground for say, um, watering or um, um, looking for uh, uh, blight um, and disease um, or isolating blight and disease for pesticides and, and chemicals um, and for nutrients. Um, and so that's a common function. That part is the manipulation, right? So in that case, if we think of that kind of example, um, and many farms have this now, this ability to use aerial imagery from a drone that is then um, um, communicated, transmitted to say a combine or a ground-based vehicle. Often that's still driven by a human, but it has automation to make it easier. Um, and then it can also make use of um, you know, a, uh, um, a device that is uh, sprinkling, you know, spraying pesticides or again, nutrients or uh, can, can then um, adjust its parameters of what it's delivering. And that's part of the manipulation part, this ability to, while it might be spraying or, but it's still affecting the world around it based on this uh, information that was de developed by the drone. Um, so those two aspects of moving around locomotion and manipulation are really key to uh, robotics. Um, and there are a number of things that are hard about robotics. I'm not going to go into these details, um, but it's how to control it, how to get it to do what we want it to do. Um, where is it? Um, to us, to us humans, what we call kinematics where is our arm? Where is our body with respect to the room? Um, these are second nature. Again, we learn these as babies by just crawling around the room. Um, but robots have to be programmed how to do this. Um, and the mathematics is pretty complex um, because you know, where my finger ends up right, is dependent on a whole lot of muscles, just hundreds and even thousands of muscle fibers throughout my arm that can move it in all kinds of different ways, yet I can still reach out and touch my camera um, with precision. Um, and robots have to do that whole thing of figuring that out. And, and we as humans don't think about the computations, the math that goes into telling, well, where is the tip of my finger? Um, but robots have to do that all through computations. Um, this programming is really hard because right now all our robots are programmed by humans. This idea of the Terminator or the, the liquid metal man, which could not only reprogram its physical self, but it could also program what it was doing. Um, you know, the, in that scene, the robot pours itself into a helicopter and then takes over flying. Um, you know, how did it figure out to go from riding a motorcycle to flying a helicopter? Um, again, that's a change in its programming. Um, and, and we do those things effortlessly. It's hard. You know, we can, we can walk down the, down the street and suddenly see, hey, here's a bakery and they have donuts. I like donuts. I'm going to get it. I, I, I think I'm going to get a uh, change of plan. I'm going to go in. I'm going to walk in and get a donut. Right. Or, or there's a chocolate turtle brownie or whatever. And uh, the point is, is that's easy for us to reprogram ourselves. Um, it's not so easy for a robot. And then finally, the idea of path planning. Um, one of the reasons that we have drones that can fly around pretty much all by themselves and take pictures of our field and relay them to a combine without a pilot but the combine usually has a driver. And that's because the path planning problem of where to move, how to get from point A to point B is much easier for a drone, which is up in free space because most of the air is empty. Um, whereas <clears throat> if you're navigating on a field, say a cornfield, right? With corn up higher than, than uh, ourselves, you know, we, it's, it's sometimes hard to navigate. Sometimes you can maybe squeeze between the plants. Often you can, it's too dense. You have to go down the rows and figure out, oh, how do I get 
or or find a break um, in the uh, in the plantings. Again, that's what we call path planning problem. Um, how do you avoid objects? Um, and think of the um, crop dusters, which have to fly around, and at the same time, you know, they're they're planning paths such that the chemicals or nutrients that they're spraying get where they need to be. And yet at the same time, they have to be able to avoid trees. They have to avoid power lines. They have to avoid cell towers, which sometimes appear um, um, even overnight, literally as the uh, uh, cell phone companies erect temporary towers um, to uh, test cell phone coverage. You know, and this is one of the things that believe it or not, crop dusters complain about um, <clears throat> is that ability to detect and avoid objects. Um, and so those are all kind of the problems that um, um, are, are common in robots, robotics. And, and, and we're not going to talk to much of these in detail. That's just kind of a survey. Um, but I wanted to give you a, a, an overview. Um, and I'm going to stop for just a minute and, and, and uh, let you guys uh, see, are there any questions you have um, about some of those specifics we talked about? I'm also going to get a drink here. Any questions you guys have? Because we haven't talked about farms yet. So what do you guys think has, this has to do with uh, the future of farming? Cora? It would give the farmers more time to focus on doing other things if the robots could do some of the other jobs by themselves. Yeah. Because we've been putting more and more automation into the farms, right? We used to pull plows by, uh, by ox um, or hack the soil ourselves. I mean, think of, you know, humans started farming about 10,000 years ago, um, organized farming. And that was really a key part of when humans started to dominate the uh, the ecosystem. Um, in fact, in the environmental record, we can see 5,000 years ago, human farming, agriculture, organized agriculture had grown so big that it started to have climate effects. Um, we start to see warming of the climate 5,000 years ago um, from uh, agricultural activity. Um, and the problem is now we're billions of people beyond that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have over 7 billion people on the planet. Um, we're expected, you know, we're, and, and population growth is one of those things that's exponential. So the curve keeps going up, 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 sharper and more sharply. Um, and, um, you know, so it only, it, it took us, many decades to go from 6, million, 6 billion to 7 billion people, it's not taking so long to go to eight and 9 billion. And we're expected to have 9 billion people on the earth by 2050. Um, food production will nearly double in that time frame. Um, there are different projections, whether it's 70% or 100% more food. Even though, you know, we're not doubling the population, much of the Earth's population is, um, you know, dealing with either famine conditions or starvation, right? And over the last few decades, we've been solving that problem where we've started to distribute more food globally. Um, and so the amount per person that um, people are consuming on the Earth is increasing. Right. So not only is the number of people increasing, but the amount of food per person they're consuming is increasing. Again, as we start to 
um, <clears throat> make headway in eliminating hunger around the world. Um, <clears throat> but that means, you know, we're going to have to have an enormous increase in food. And we actually have a shrinking land base. Pretty much all of the arable land is in use right now. And in fact, because the pop human population is growing, we're actually consuming farmland um, to build houses and to build housing and, and jobs and everything else for, uh, for people. Plus there's erosion, there's other things going on. Um, and so there's a shrinking land base to, to create that food. And of course, climate uh, change is occurring. We're, we're getting more extreme weather events. Um, pest pressures you know, are shifting as a result of, of changing climates. Um, and, uh, and this is causing changes in productivity as well, right? Farmers have gotten far more productive, um, particularly if you look just at the United States. Um, um, the average farmer from the 1930s um, is uh, feeding about 12 times as many people per farmer, right, as, uh, as they were in the 1930s. Uh, so 12 times more productive. Um, and, uh, and again, there's uh, food insecurity and, and uh, throughout the land, so, or throughout the, this, this situation. Um, and so, um, and at the same time, we're trying to make our food more safe, uh, more sustainable because of that. Um, and again, productivity just has to increase because we just don't have the land to, to do it. Uh, we're looking at doing things in space. We're looking things, doing things uh, in, in water and in, in air even, um, in uh, what was considered uh, non-arable land, um, but you know, vertical farms in cities and, and things like that. But another aspect of this that is kind of interesting is that animal consumption uh, animal protein consumption is also increasing. In fact, it's increasing faster than the rate of population growth. Um, because, and one of the reasons is, um, you know, like bears, you know, humans are, are omnivores. You know, we are designed to be able to um, eat both plants um, and other animals. Um, and animal consumption has been has long been associated with wealth, um, and so um, the uh, there's an association with um, you know an increase in that that this is one of the things that's impacting that um, increase in um, um, consumption of animal protein. Um, you know another interesting thing is pollution increases with people. Um, that and that just means right that that we're we're polluting the earth in various ways, uh, both water, land, and and air. Yet um, there's actually an inverse relationship um, with wealth and pollution that it grows and then starts to go down per capita um, once. Um, um, industrialized nations reach a certain level of uh, uh, productivity for their people, um, they start to get more efficient, basically. Um, and, and all this puts together um, this fact that, that animals are actually, as a, as a food source, are fundamentally different than crops. Um, and there are two ways that that, that, that matters. Um, one is that um, humans care about individual animals in a way that we don't care about individual um, ears of corn or grains of wheat, right? That, you know, we have a kinship, you know, some of you mentioned, you know, having dogs, um, you know, we don't eat dogs generally, dogs are pets, they're in, in many cultures, they're parts of the family. Um, and they're critical for, for survival in almost all um, you know, animals are critical to survival in almost all cultures um, in some way, whether that be horses or cows or dogs or whatever. Um, and and that's, that is something that's unique to animal agriculture versus crop agriculture. And the other thing is what we refer to as the closed loop time scales. Um, you know, if you think of a, a field of corn, 
that is uh, in a non-irrigated area, um, you know, it's going to get rain events, you know, in, in the corn's lifetime, in the corn plant's lifetime, it's going to get rained on a few times, right? Uh, you know, maybe 10, maybe it'll make, you know, double digits, right? But in general, it's not going to get water or different nutrients um, in a natural environment very often. Um, and and, that's, com and, and uh, that's completely different from animals, which um, are often fed at least a couple of times a day. So if you think of a cow um, on uh, that's uh, <clears throat> uh, a cow bred for either beef or dairy, right? They're going to get fed at least often, uh, at least a couple times a day. And there are even experimental farms that are going to hourly feedings. Um, and so that's what we mean by the closed loop time scale is much faster. The time from putting an input into the animal, in this case, food or nutrients or water, is happening on a minute by minute or hour by hour basis, as opposed to an ear of corn, which may not get water. It may go two weeks without a water input. Okay. And that, of course, results in growth. That's the output. Um, and those time scales from input to output and back, right? Um, eating, growing, eating, growing, um, you know, are much faster with, uh, with animals. Um, and, and these all put demands on engineering systems that kind of help, okay? Um, here are some interesting uh, facts from the USDA, right? 50% of all of US land is devoted to ag production of some form. Um, and uh, you know, that includes both uh, uh, crop agriculture and animal agriculture. Agriculture in the United States uses 10% of the entire energy budget. Um, 70 to 80% of all fresh water used in the United States goes to agriculture. Um, you know, there are 20 million tons of fertilizers and, and uh, herbicides and such. I'm sorry, that's just the fertilizer. And then there are additional things for the herbicides and, and pesticides. Um, and again, as I've said before, um, we're pretty much tapped out. Um, you know, we're creating a few new things here and there and reclaiming some land like deserts as we start to irrigate them. Um, we work with Peru. Um, and they're in high desert and, uh, you know, they're irrigating a lot of their uh, um, desert areas that are high in the mountains because they're good for things like a uh, grape uh, production for wine. But at the same time, to irrigate those high plains that are often at, at six, seven, eight thousand feet altitude, <clears throat> they're dependent on snowpack and glacier melt coming down from the mountains because bringing water up from sea level is, is a very expensive process. Um, and this is an example where, but with climate change, those glaciers are shrinking. And so potential water supplies for um, creating new arable land uh, in, in Peru, right? This is all interconnected. And that's what's so exciting. Um, <clears throat> and so again, it comes back to these three things, the sustainability, safety, and productivity are all important parts of, uh, of farming, not just um, at the local level, but globally. I mean, we care about this, you know, at the county level, at the state level, at the, at the national level, and, and uh, at the global level. Um, and, um, you know, we want to know, you know, if there is, um, as we get denser and denser, there are chances for disease, things like uh, mad cow disease and, and uh, other, other forms of um, um, blight or infection that, that can be um, transmitted to other animals or other plants. Um, and that has to do with the safety. Um, so we want to be able to trace. Um, and at the same time, we have to increase productivity to meet demand. And at the same time, um, it's sustainable. You know, where there is a lot of concern we're putting by increasing the productivity of our farms, are we, there are some serious questions, are we actually stressing the ability of the earth to produce um, because of 
the critical, uh, the microbiome of the soil, for example, there's, and uh, the, the aquifers are all um, things that are in delicate balance. The more water we need for plants, the more we're sucking it away from the natural filtration systems that, that desaltify water and um, all that. So, um, and that's where agrobotics has come in. We've already mentioned some of this um, briefly in the um, crop space. And that drones, as, as, I've, uh, as I've talked about, um, are able, this is a um, artist conception here, but the, the, the two plots in the upper left and lower right are actually real um, that represent um, the flight path of a drone over a field um, that's using multi-spectral multi sensors to um, determine um, crop viability. Now, okay, I just threw a buzzword at you. Multi-spectral sens multi sensors. What does that mean? Anybody have an idea? Cordell, Joe Cora? Do you guys know what I mean when I say something like multi-spectral sensors? It would sense more than one thing. Yeah, and what? That's the multi. What is spectral? Light. It's a particular spectrum of light. Yes. Ultraviolet. So, go ahead. Uh, ultraviolet. Yeah, um, that's one spectrum. Infrared is another spectrum. The visible range is is you know these are spectra that we talk about that uh, generally when we talk about a spectrum it's a range of values and so yeah the multi-spectral sensors are basically cameras that can see not just in the visible range but in the infrared in the ultraviolet um, so you're exactly right um, and and so they're cameras that are more sensitive than our human eyes. Um, and they can tell um, when uh, uh, plants are under stress, um, either due to a drought, for example, or um, insufficient nutrients or disease. Um, and so that's what this, and this is the path planning problem that I had mentioned earlier. On the upper left, we see a picture of um, a, the yellow traces are kind of the approximate, this is where the drone needs to go. Um, and, and the farmer basically set this up um, to tell the drone where to gather imagery. Um, because the farmer knows his or her land boundaries. Um, and so it sets up an approximate um, path, this yellow line and yellow zigzag line. We call this a meander line because it's meandering like a river. Um, and it goes through this and takes a series of images. And then the green line is where a drone actually flew according to the GPS track. So it's trying to maintain this, but it has some parameters about how much it can, what the radius of its turns can be and such. This was um, a fixed wing drone uh, because a, what I, what the picture here, and I say this is, this is a cartoon um, and an artist's conception, because although this looks like a legitimate drone, in fact, is a picture of a, of a real drone, um, it's really not feasible for a drone of this size to be carrying um, enough liquid chemicals that it can spray on a big field like this. Um, but it is illustrating the point that we have two basic kinds of drones that can be used. Um, one is helicopter-like, or what we call a multi-rotor drone, multi drone, like this one, and the other one being a fixed-wing type of airplane. Does that make sense? Um, 
And the advantage, of course, of the multi-rotor drone is that it can hover in place and it can move kind of, it can actually follow right angle turns. But a fixed wing aircraft has to keep, because it can hover in place. Again, the fixed wing aircraft cannot hover in place. It has to keep moving um, to stay in the air because lift is generated by the wind um, the air traveling over the wings. And so um, it's easy to plan these kind of rectangular paths. You just put a few points to follow, but the fixed wing drone has constraints that it can't take a zero radius turn. It has to um, do these swooping turns that you see from the green line. Um, so again, this is helping, this, this is where the, um, this is the drone and the farmer working together because it's easy for the farmer to specify this grid of points. Here's how I want you to fly. But it's hard for the farmer, unless the farmer is a pilot, right? It's hard for the farmer to actually know precisely what is the drone gonna have to do to follow, to, to take all those pictures. Um, and so the drone's computer is good at that, right? It can figure out, yeah, okay, I know the radius. I know how fast I have to go. I know what kind of radius I can make. And then it plans the uh, actual shape to try to get as close as possible to the ideal thing that the farmer wants. And that's what I was talking about earlier of this kind of new generation of robot and sensors that we're working with these days are designed to help humans um, do tasks rather than um, replace humans, okay? And then after gathering all that data um, from the farm and processing it from these, not just the visual image, but different, the ultraviolet and the infrared, it can use all these different sensor values um, across all the pixels of these images to try to predict, you know, again, and that and that we see in the lower right hand corner, a rendition, an overlay over a picture of the field of where the, the trouble spots are um, that may need either more water or more nutrients, for example. Um, and again, that is what we're doing, we're, we've been doing this fairly regularly in, in farming for, for a couple of decades now. But this, the question is, and so we're increasing productivity, we're increasing the, the quality of the food and the safety of, of crops. Um, but why haven't we seen this sort of thing with animals? Any ideas? Is it because the crops are kind of stationary and they're easy to, to monitor with the drones, but um, what, what could you, how could you monitor animals with a drone? Are you talking specifically with drones or, or other robots? Yeah, any robots, right? Could it be drones? Could it be other robots? And yeah, and that comes back to this question we, we talked about, why are animals fundamentally different? Because, you know, with crops, we, we usually do this, you know, once every few weeks or something, right? But because that's how often we feed and water them, right? But, um, you know, at least that's kind of how drought and, and disease emerge. Um, but it's much faster with um, animals. Um, and that's that time scale. And also this nature that, yeah, if we, if, if uh, an ear of corn dies, we don't really care, right? Um, you know, we just want to get most of the corn as much as we can of the good stuff. Um, and so you're right. Um, those are issues now, but we see where these benefits are happening in crop agriculture. Now we're talking about precision animal agriculture. How can we apply these similar technologies where we have robots that are basically carrying sensors and using that to impact the way we feed and water them? 
so that we can improve their productivity, um, improve the quality and safety of the food. But the key thing that's really different is we're also improving the animal welfare. Okay, and that's really what the farmer was, that was the farmer's main job on a dairy farm, right? Way back when my, my office mate was talking about uh, Rosebud 23, right? Their prized milking cow um, was, you know, really paying attention because, um, you know, if, if the cow got sick, um, if the cow got mastitis or, or any of these things started to get irritated by the milking machines or, uh, you know, reduce the quality of the milk, you know, they, they really zeroed in on those qu relatively quickly changing um, diseases and pathologies. Lameness, you know, can emerge relatively quickly compared to the days or weeks that it takes in, uh, um, often in uh, um, crop farming. And so um, we started to look at specifically um, this idea. And of course, as farms got bigger and bigger, um, as they consolidated, often without changing staff, as I mentioned earlier, right, it just became, it's becoming harder and harder to provide that individual attention. And in fact, um, you know, a lot more of the large farms are using automated methods to figure out average performance, average productivity. Um, but it's really important for animals um, that we have individualized monitors of productivity. And that's one of the areas that we've been looking at for uh, individual robots and sensors. Okay, and so here's an example of in a dairy farm where, you know, you've got a number of cows, they go out, they may go to pasture, they may be in a, in a feedlot, um, they have to get food, they have to get water, they have to be milked um, a couple of times, maybe three times a day. Um, and if we can sensorize all these various aspects using sensors to measure milk quality, which, you know, is routinely done now in the industry, um, through uh, milk fat and milk solid measurements that are happening while the cows are milking. They, they measure volume um, and that keeps um, the farmer uh, in tune in terms of, of how cows are, um, are, are producing with ear tags, often with RFID or readable ear tags, barcodes. Um, the uh, uh, milking parlor and the milking machine can actually know which particular cow um, is uh, being milked at a time. Um, we have systems now that allow cows to be kind of milked themselves. So when they feel ready to milk, um, in, in, uh, in some cases in automated farms, they can just uh, go to the milking parlor on their own. Um, sometimes it uh, depends how different farms are managed. Um, uh, whether they're brought in, um, uh, again, whether they choose or whether they're herded in at certain times to milk. But again, all these are ways that farmers can choose to impact um, not only the quality and productivity of the animals, but the animal's welfare. In other words, how the animals feel. Because one of the things we know from, from research um, in animal welfare is that the anxiety levels and um, kind of state of satisfaction of the cows um, or animals in general actually can impact the quality and the productivity of the protein itself. So while our plan with these animals um, that we use for food is to kill and eat them eventually, um, you know, it, it is, to our benefit to, ma to monitor um, not only the productivity and the safety, but also the welfare. And these are all things because they, they're all working together to determine what the end quality of the product is um, and the amount. And that's, these are some of the things that over the last many decades we've been optimizing um, through automation and um, um, hybridization. But, um, you know, 
also just from um, oversight, right, to make sure that uh, farms, both for crops and animals, are um, you know operating at peak efficiency. Now, I'm going to not talk. Uh, one of the things then we're focused a lot on um, the rumen of uh, cows in particular because it's um, really the most um, um, efficient fermenters on the planet, right? Or the cow stomach um, or rumen. And, uh, and so that's one thing we're focused on because as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot going on inside um, the fermentation vat of, of a cow that, that we don't fully understand. We know a lot about the, the fatty acids that go into um, creating that process that breaks down what um, you know the hay is and, and the, the feeds are often these undigestible um, proteins and sugars that then get converted through the animal into human digestible uh, proteins. Um, and, and again, that's part, you know, understanding what's going on inside the cow um, is uh, key to increasing productivity. And so we've been looking at a lot of these issues from the standpoint, um, and we often use cannulated cows in, in research that you, uh, you may or may not be familiar with. Um, have you uh, have you ever seen or, or worked with a cannulated cow before, either of you? Cora or Cordell? No. You know what I mean by a cannulated cow? I mean, we see a picture of it no. here. Um, cannulas are um, uh, basically holes in the body. The same thing we use for surgery on humans um, is it's a it's a port. Um, into the body if we need to do surgery um, or if we need to uh, do like um, a pacemaker gets inserted um, into a human, for example, um, as, a, um, as an inserted device to keep the heart working properly. Um, and um, one thing that we often do in research is create these cannulated cows. So these are cannula that um, allow us to put sensors and actually measure the rumen fluids themselves. So we can sample, we can take uh, some fluid out of the cow here through, and that's what uh, um, these, uh, these students are doing, is they're removing some of the contents um, of a cow's stomach so that we can study what's going on during um, um, digestion. And um, but a problem with this is the cow stomach or the rumen is normally anaerobic, which means it doesn't have oxygen um, because, of course, it's a sealed chamber and it's creating gases. When you open up the cannula um, to put in a sensor or, or to take um, material out, well, that's exposing it to oxygen, which actually changes oxygen is highly oxygen is reactive. So it combines with some of the chemicals and changes um, the uh, sensors. Um, and so what we what we're trying to do is create some sensors kind of based on insect locomotion that can actually measure different aspects of the rumen. Um, looking at things like the pH of the, um, uh, the ruminal fluid, um, the volatile fatty acids are kind of the goal. Those are the actual enzymes that do the bulk of the breaking down of this indigestible uh, protein and turning it into human digestible protein. Um, and there are 25 of those. Um, we think three of them are really important. We don't really know what the others do, um, but we know that, that, that the bulk of the work done in this conversion process is done by those three volatile fatty acids. But again, there are a bunch of others. And so we're creating sensors for all those that we can actually swim around with a robotic device in the fluid because the stomach is very stratified in the chemistry that, that does this. Um, and then of course, you gotta get that data out of the cow and uh, throughout the farm and getting ultimately getting it back 
to the, uh, the farmer. Um, and so what this requires is a network, just like our internet connects, um, you know, you might have room, you know, your, your computer might be in different rooms in your house, but you have a base station somewhere in your house for Wi-Fi, and then that's connected to your, um, your cable network, your modem or whatever, which is connects all the houses in your neighborhood, which then goes to some central router, which is somewhere in the city. Um, so there's this network of connections. Well, to get data, unless we're writing it down on paper, we've got to do the same thing, is we have to create data connections so that we can get this information even from inside the cow or from collars the cow is wearing um, so that we can know about when it's ruminating and how often and how well it's feeling. And, um, you know, again, they're social animals. So we also want to know things about, well, how is cow to cow interaction um, impacting what they do? Um, because just like humans, sometimes they are bully cows and they are submissive cows. Um, and the submissive cows often don't get to eat as much, right? They get kind of pushed to the side. Um, and there are these social behaviors that also affect the welfare of, of uh, animals. And then, of course, you collect all that, figure out what to do and who to do it to, right? In terms of if someone's getting sick or if they need more nutrients, then you have to have this manipulation standpoint that we talked about of robots of being able to affect the world, which means in the case of a cow, what can we feed it? Um, can we feed it some vitamins if it's, if it's deficient? Or can we feed it um, if it's uh, starting to show signs of, uh, of, of an infection or, or something? Can we feed it antibiotics? Or can we do things, um, again, put inputs into the system to improve the outputs, which are the quality and the quantity of the, the, the meals uh, or of the protein. And so basically, again, we're trying to get back to this um, state where farmers know the individual um, capabilities of um, each of their animals. Now, I'm gonna um, shift gears a little bit here and um, so that's kind of where we are, have been trying to position some of our work. And we see this is happening really following the model we already see for crop agriculture. How can we do this, you know, large scale sensing and then networking of the data to make decisions about how to feed and how to improve um, the uh, performance of the animal, where we're caring now about individual animals and not just the overall um, output of how many gallons of milk went out this morning, um, but you know how is each individual animal doing? So I'm going to skip over some of these and talk a little bit about, again, getting back to, I showed this picture earlier. Um, this is one of our little robots. Um, and this one's actually made out of paper. Um, and that's uh, exactly what you guys have right now um, in your packets. Did both of you get your packets, Cordell and Cora? No. You did not get your packet? Oh, bummer. How about you, Cora? Um, I'm sorry, Cora, I couldn't hear that. Evidently, our two-day shipping wasn't fast enough. Uh-oh. Um, I'm assuming they'll come today then. Yeah. So what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what we're going to do is one of the things, again, we've been looking at, well, um, the, a, a problem with, another problem with farming we haven't talked about is the profit margins, what the business model is. And... The United States has some of the cheapest um, food in the entire world. Um, our food system is um, considerably cheaper even than Europe, for example. Um, um, uh, you know, Europe and the United States 
in terms of industrialized nations, we have similar economies, but uh, typically our food is, um, our European food is about 40% more expensive. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, it's, uh, I got that wrong. It's, it's about three times more expensive. It's about 40% of Europeans' typical budget goes into food, where it's more like 10 to 15% um, of an American's budget goes to food in the United States. And so there's a huge disparity, even in industrialized nations, of um, the profitability of um, the uh, um, agribusiness sector, right, is much thinner um, and, and of course, in, in areas where food is, is scarce, you know, it's even actually more valuable. Um, and so um, that has a, a profound effect on farm decisions, right? Is because food is just um, very cheap. And as a result, the margins for um, things like a new equipment, a new combine, a new harvester, um, and uh, compared to robots in every cow. Um, you know, these things have to be affordable. Um, sensors um, that are used for, um, you know, diagnosis of disease and, and milk quality and meat quality and productivity, um, things like scales. Um, and so, you know, we've been looking at, at, at robots, both for crop agriculture and animal agriculture that are made of, um, very low cost materials like paper or plastics. Um, and so that's what we're going to kind of experiment with you a little bit um, today in our, uh, our build time. And um, the, uh, I'm gonna show this little video of, I think it's starting, no, no I'll go ahead and start it. Um, not sure if this has, now that I think about it, I don't think this has sound. Um, these are this uh, little paper bot that, that we've made. And that's what um, um, I sent out the images, um, but I'm gonna show you briefly how, uh, how to build it. And that was gonna be our, our kind of main activity was uh, looking at, at some of the actual uh, mechanisms of uh, this particular type of robot, which we call a, a, a cockroach. And Basically, this has a, a little sensor and I'm um, flashing a, uh, um, a laser on it and uh, which is causing it to basically run away from the light. Um, and uh, the, um, we have a, a version of this that, that has two sensors it can actually steer, right? So th in, this, in this case, it's just a, uh, um, a little uh, scurrying robot, but we wanted to talk about, in, and we're actually gonna do a fabrication. If you don't have your parts, I did send, um, uh, I emailed a, uh, a version that you could actually cut out. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a couple, um, you know, just um, what it takes to uh, fold and build this. Um, and uh, I will also send out some instructions. Hey, Data, um, can you email um, to the um, um, invite list for the uh, uh, calendar? Can you send out that uh, um, instruction sheet that I uh, sent to you? Uh, sure, I'll do that right now. Buddy, can you do that right now uh, while I'm talking? And then we'll just show um, briefly how to uh, how to do the assembly. Whoops, go back again. Um, but yeah, the point is 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 um, this has some printable. Um, this actually has some printable electronics on it, so we're doing printable. Um, sensing and printable cognition. Remember those three parts of what we defined as a robot was perception, cognition, and manipulation or actuation. So the actuation part here is this motor that's been glued on. Um, that's the big, uh, I'm going to pause that right here and say this area up here is just the motor that we glued on. And then you guys have this section for how to build these parts down here. Um, 
And um, um, but that is our uh, um, basic little uh, toy that we're uh, doing. And let me, uh, oops, oh, excuse, uh, hold on just a minute while I. Where is my, oh, I know, I've got to switch. Let me switch things here. Um, um, let me see, where is the, sorry, folks. Since I moved in, Slides up. Okay. Um, I should have sent the instructions right now. Okay. Thank you. So again, these are the uh, the robots and the uh that we're uh going to show you uh just uh, quickly how to build um and we'll just go over the process you guys can oops what did i just do here there we go let me go back um What I want to talk about is um, what's called a four bar linkage. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. getting smaller anyway so this is uh, how do i make it loop in this player There we go. Okay. Um, so this is uh, an image of um, what's called a four bar linkage. Um, and what you can see is there's this red bar, there's a light green bar, there's a dark green bar. And then um, these bars are mounted to the ground. So I'm going to pause that right here. Whoops. There we go. So you can see it kind of creates a parallelogram um, that goes from this point. There's A, B, C, and then back here is connected to ground. So both of those things are mounted to the ground. Um, and that, those are the four bars then that we call a, um, a four bar linkage. Um, and so you know, it's very much like this, right? Where my whoops, where my fingers represent one, two, three, four bars. And what the video is showing is if I move this angle over here, then there's a one to one correspondence from this angle on this side to say this angle on that side. So the opposite bar. And in fact, the entire four bar linkage has that relationship. And that's what we see from this video that um, there is, if you trace out particular angles around this point here, there's only for each, you know, if I if I stop it and go a little bit further, 
right? There is a prescribed location given the red bar, that uh, the angle of the red bar that defines where the light green bar goes and where the dark green bar goes. And so that's an important um, relationship that actually, and again, we call this four bar linkage, um, is a fundamental structure in um, oops, oh, sorry. There we go. Let me cancel that. That allow us to um, so here's another four bar linkage um, that we can control one of these angles. And that's what gives us a relationship to all of the other angles in the chain, okay? Uh, in that four bar mechanism. So we're gonna talk about those because that's essentially what the basis for this mechanism is um, that at least does the walking um, of the, um, robot. So I'm going to pull, oops, going to pull this guy over. Um, and so these, you can see that this robot, um, these are a locomotion robot, as we talked about that difference between manipulation and locomotion or moving around. Um, and, you know, we're building, and this is for ground um, motion, but the endpoints here, I'm going to get a little bit better picture to show. I think this is the one I want. Yeah. Now, here's an intermediate step. If we look at the end here, um, this piece is um, basically a series of these four pieces that I'm drawing here, right? Which creates that little box. And there are several of them here. Um, these little boxes here, which are and these cons uh, come on, get it so it moves. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, so these little connections form, again, a four bar linkage. If we look in the end of that little piece. Um, so pull out my robot. If you look at the camera here, You can see that little box is what I'm talking about. Okay. So, again, that creates this four bar linkage. And that is the whoops, that is the basis for how this robot moves. Because basically, this is going to go back and forth like that. And that causes these legs to wag. And when we put the little motor on, which you guys don't have one, but we're gonna show you, then those things kind of vibrate back and forth. Um, and the way this works, let me mobile with my camera here. Oh, 
And so you can see now my little cockroach scurries away. Um, and um, that only has one motor on it, so it doesn't have the ability to steer itself. But that is how our, um, uh, I'm getting, uh, And so the way this works is we have six legs, and this is called an alternating tripod gate. Because if we go back to our drawing, if you think of a camera tripod, and let me pick a different color here. If you think about a camera tripod, right? If the legs um, spread out, right? And you have your camera on top, it won't tip over, right? And that is true as long as the, if you have a mass in the center, <coughs> pardon me. Um, it won't tip over as long as the mass stays inside that tripod of support. But if the mass hangs over the side of the tripod, then the tripod is going to tip over, right, in that direction. Oh, I can't rotate that, wrong arrow. Um, right? So it's going to fall that way toward the weight, okay? So basically, um, the way that this robot moves is it has two tripods. That's why it has six legs. And what it's doing is it takes these two tripods, which are interlaced, and one of the tripods move at a time because as long as the weight of the robot stays in the middle of its tripod, it doesn't need all six legs to keep from falling over. It just needs three, okay? And so these little tripods of legs then just kind of inch forward, and that's what keeps it from tipping over while still able to move forward because of course a table can have four legs or even six legs but it can't walk right you need that ability to pick one set of legs up just like we do with our two legs we pick one leg up and we move it forward right and then we pick the other leg up but we're balancing like a pogo stick right and that's hard if you have this tripod, so it's always sitting on a tripod, and then the tripods are moving, that's much easier to control. Um, and that's how we can make cheap, low-cost robots. And on this robot, um, I'm sure if that's quite in focus, um, we actually have printed um, electronics. So this is its brain printed inside the paper. And that is one of the kind of magic recipes to the stuff that we sent you is it's not just paper, but here's one of the cutouts. And the way we made these is we first took, uh, I'm gonna see if you can see this with the camera. Ah, see, you can see we've made some cuts in this paper, okay? So we made some cuts in the paper and then we made a sandwich. 
So we took some plastic and you can see this is just an adhesive film that's clear. And we took the plastic and we can print sensors and electronics like these. We print, so this is actually a sensor here that measures bend. And then here are some wires that go into some resistors. And these are electrical components that have also been printed by our 3D printer. Um, and then we have another component here as a capacitor. So this actually goes into a measurement device and a filter. Um, and we can have even more sophisticated things that we're printing again on this plastic layer that we then take and we put it between these sheets that we have pre-printed. We fold them up and glue them together and we press them together so that we actually get a three layer sandwich. And so there's paper on the outside, which is stiffener. And so that's like a bone. And then there is um, this flexible plastic on the inside, which is kind of like the cartilage or tendons that hold your bones together, okay? And then we can print nerves. You can think of it that way, that we're printing um, neurons and sensors onto that plastic on the inside. And that's what allows us to make these um, uh, cockroach, basically, with, uh, with this guy um, that can run away from light. And that's just one example, okay? So we folded these things up, we glued them all together, and so you have this little sandwich, and the cuts, that we made in these pieces allow a living hinge. So the plastic can act as a hinge as well as for that, for those tendons um, and ligaments that hold the stiff pieces together. And you end up with, um, oops, let me get out of my bag of tricks here. Some of the example pieces. with these three pieces, okay? And those are indicated to you also in the uh, um, file that uh, Dr. Uh, just sent you. Um, but the way we make the four bar linkage is these end pieces, um, you can see have these little strips with five sections. And so what we do first is we roll this up into a square. So that becomes our four bar linkage, which is just like this thing going back and forth right, which is the same that you see on the screen, right, that guy, only instead of just going back and forth, that guy's actually rotating all the way around. I can't do that with my fingers very well, so I'm just going back and forth. The red bar is just going back and forth, kind of like the, the green bar, um, but by Got to take my glue stick out of my pocket here. Pardon me. Um, so we take our little glue stick and we can glue, put some glue on just the one square. That's square number five in the instructions, the fifth segment. And by rolling it over and connecting it, 
And it's kind of helpful to have a pencil or a pair of tweezers to make those stick together. So there is one of the four bar linkages. So I can push on that. So I can push on that and then that moves back and forth, just like the video, okay? And if you do that with all three, now this is the top piece. This is the bottom piece. And you can see each one has three of these strips. And so those are all going to be folded over, rolled over. Sorry, rolled over and glued. And what you end up with as there is a, uh, a picture is the Got it buried here. So you're going to end up with um, a top and a bottom piece that each has three um, four bar linkages glued in place, but they should all still be able to move. Okay, so the, while the fifth square is firmly attached to the first square, To make the four bar linkage, right? The two, three, and four, those squares can still move freely if you push on, push on the side, for example. Okay. Now, if you take the bottom piece with its four. I'm, I'm sorry, with its three four bar linkages, I have to keep remembering uh, the numbers. Um, then you can take the bottom piece and um, we're going to lay the middle piece on top. Now, one thing that I need to point out, and it's pointed out in the instructions, is we have to make sure we fold them in the right way, okay? So this is correct. If I open them up, Right, and if I put the um, the two doubles, then these connectors need to be on opposite sides because we're going to put these on top with the middle piece in the middle. So that they all glue together on alternate sides, <clears throat> uh, meaning that there's going to be there's a top piece, there's the bottom piece, and then this piece is going to end up in the middle, OK? 
So we simply take the bottom piece. Oops. Lay the middle piece on top. Although I know you can't see this yet. Hold on just a minute because I just broke one of the. Uh, I'm going to re glue one of my uh, four bar linkages. So give me just a minute. So I am. So there's my bottom piece with these connectors off to the right. I have a top piece oops, with the connectors, these little connectors off to the left. And the four bar linkages are hanging underneath the top part and they're on top of the bottom part, so they both come to the inside. And that's how I put the middle piece. But first, I have to fold it because it has a little accordion section in the middle. OK, and so we need to fold it up like an accordion. Because I, I think you can see that I'm pushing them in so they get closer together and further apart, closer together, further apart. So that center section squishes together. And in fact, see it moves like that. Okay, because we folded those up in a little zigzag. And so now I'm going to see if this will show up on my keyboard table. So I take this guy with its four bar linkages up and to the right, and the connectors here to the right. And then I'm going to place this guy down on top of these three. And so you can put glue here and here. Let me get this down a little bit closer. But I think it shows you how uh, there, there's the uh, instructions in the, but you put, you can put glue on either the bottom side of these on the, the bottom side of these tabs or on the tops of those three four bar linkages. And then what we're gonna do is attach the glue side. Now I have, mine are a little mismatched here. I think you guys have the correct ones where this one is a little bit wider. So that's getting glued on to the top three four bars, and you have to squeeze these guys in to get the uh, third one to glue. And 
And I have uh, drawn a couple of mismatched pieces here. Apologies. Let me see if this is the right side. No. Nope. Oh. Uh, I hope the right kit, the right uh, middle pieces got sent. But um, they just have to be folded in. Uh... Okay, here's another using another piece here. So basically these guys are folded up. Now we have the, um, once those are glued on top for three parts, then you take the other piece and with the, those have the, um, four bar linkages facing down when the um, connectors are in and those are gonna go on top and glue down so that we have these three layers and have this one that I can open up a little bit. See, this one has the three layers, the top, middle and bottom. Okay, and now what happens is if we grab the middle layer, then when the middle layer goes this, this way, what happens is, uh, I think you can see that that this one, the two four bar linkages, the middle four bar and the outer four bars, they actually move in opposite directions because those are the two um, tripods. So the middle, the middle layer is connected to this one, this one, this one, and this one, on the top, and then this one, this one, and this one on the bottom. And so as these move forward and backward, one of the tri the two tripods move in opposite directions, and that's what causes this to move on the um, on the ground. Okay. Now, um, and so this is, again, this is a form of origami. Um, so it's origami robotics, right? That allows us to take these specialized materials that we can use. Again, we can print different active circuitry on these and build um, the, uh, the device. And then, um, again, we didn't provide the motors, but if you're interested, um, you can get these um, from, this is actually out of a game called Duck Hunter. Um, and so this is a little game, um, that we buy these things relatively cheaply. Uh, they're about $30, $35 or something like that, $50 someplace, some places. Um, but you can get them on eBay, you can get them uh, relatively cheap. And they're, they're cool because um, they have made these little lightweight um, flying ducks. And uh, in fact, and they provide you a charger in the form of a little pistol with sound effects, but this is my charger. Um, and the way this works is you plug the duck in, you pull the trigger and that charges up inside this motor. 
this is not actually a battery. It's a little capacitor that holds electric charge right here in this silver thing on the end. And that then is what, uh -oh. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I had it off. And uh, that is what, if you charge it up, causes this little dock to fly. Um, and uh, and the point of the game is you can shoot it out of the sky. Okay, but with <laughs> but we take this apart. We strip this. The dock is just made of styrofoam, and. Inside the duck is this guy, which is the, there's a little motor here, there's some gears and an elbow mechanism. Um, you can see that guy spinning. And that runs this, and here is, there's a little electronic circuit board and it's all has this plastic, very lightweight. This only weighs a few grams. Um, and it has the charging port on it and a switch. And then this is the sensor that if this is running, you can see it pause. If you shoot it three times, it then turns the motor off and, um, um that is a very lightweight motor that i just hot glue onto this but we also hot glue a couple of spikes right on the bottom here that go into they go through the hole They go through the middle hole in the top and engage in a couple of holes in the middle section. And so what that is doing, what the little motor is doing is pushing that center piece forward and backward. And then the center piece causes those um, uh, four bar linkages to again to shift in alternate directions. So one tripod goes forward when the other one goes backward and then they they exchange right and that's what causes the little robot to scurry okay so um that then is our and i'm charging this back up again we can use the little uh gun that we get as part of the game to uh to charge this up and now my robot should be at full strength, scurrying around again. And sure enough, there it goes. Whee! Anyway, okay. Um, and so again, the point of these um, low cost approaches to fabricating robots, printable robots, is so that we will eventually be able to make these cheap enough to simultaneously be able to, in our case, swim around in the rumen um, or uh, to provide data on animal productivity, animal welfare, communicating to collars that uh, uh, talk uh, that give us information about how cows are and pigs and are socializing with one another. Um, and uh, ultimately, again, trying to return that individualized attention um, of the family farm. And so that's all I have to talk about. If you have any questions, um, um, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, I think we have a little closing uh, um, um, activity that uh, we might do. But do you have any questions? Um, I have a question. When you talked about 3D printing the, um, the circuitry that would go in the robot, what are you using to 3D print those? Ah, excellent question. So 
Um, so we're actually, we're using all polymer materials. Let me uh, just pull up a file here. Um, go to this one. Okay. So here are, uh, here are examples of some of the electronics we're printing. So again, you can see that this is on a flexible substrate. We're using, um, normally, um, 3D printers are extruding a thermoplastic, which is, uh, you know, it comes out like toothpaste, but it's basically a melted plastic that once it cools, it um, solidifies, and that's how you get the body. Um, and uh, I don't have any, I used to have an example right here, but I guess I took it to the lab. Um, so um, the 3D printing, so here's an example. Um, this is a 3D printed part where again, you can see it's, it's printed layer by layer using this extrusion technique of, um, and, and it's really a lot like a hot glue gun um, is what the 3D printer is. We use, instead of thermoplastics, we use thermoplastics for the structure, but then we have additional, instead of a, of a solid extrusion, where this thing is, is um, extruding a, so, a, a, a molten paste that is becoming solid, we extrude some liquid materials that form these semiconductors, just like a silicon computer chip. So we have polymer-based, um, these are conductive wires as well as resistors and semiconducting transistors that give us the ability, um, much like a silicon integrated circuit chip, to uh, um, give us uh, computation and sensing. Does that make sense? So is that a special type of 3D printer? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what we're Wait. developing. Uh, um, one of the one of the um, alternate project, we, we call it 4D printing um, because you can print form, the 3D shape, as well as functionality. That's really amazing. <laughs> we um, have a lot of uh, or thermoplastic 3D printers in 4-H throughout the state. So we're doing a lot of that, um, that kind of work right now, but this is just really neat to be able to print the electronic component. Yeah. And, and that's what we're, what we're actually taking is we're taking a commercial 3D printer and we're augmenting it to add this fourth dimension of functionality, the functional, the functional part, so that as you print each layer with the, of the normal 3D plastic, you can interweave these layers just like we did with our... Um, you know, with our sandwich material. So we're going to be interleaving these layers of functionality for sensing and uh, um, computation and uh, actuation. And, and hopefully we'll be able to make this type of uh, what, again, what we're calling a 4D printer, um, just as affordable as many of the 3D printers that uh, um, you already have. Cordell or Cora, do you have any questions? No. Nope. No, okay. Well, I hope that your robot pieces come in the mail soon, um, but I will, um, I'll check in on that this week and just make sure that you guys get them. I was following along with the paper cutout that he had emailed this morning, and it is necessary to have uh, some tweezers or needle nose pliers because it's not very easy to use a pen in your fingers. Just a FYI. I'm not quite <laughs> done with it, but I've been working on it. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, thank you so much, Professor Voyles. We appreciate this greatly. I've learned a lot, and I think this is definitely technology that um, is going to move forward very quickly. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's not going to be in the farm um, 
this year or next, but you know, we hope that uh, we do have prototypes that we are of robots that we're forming with 3D printing technologies using soft materials and these interleave things that uh, um, we are going to start taking to some of our corporate uh, partners to uh, actually explore how these things can uh, potentially revolutionize uh, the practice of uh, animal uh, agriculture. And you'll you'll have those early adopters, I'm sure that or early adapters that say, you know, we want to get this going. Um, I was slow to um, choose the drones for our farm, but I have a drone of my own and have been flying to do crop scouting. And I remember Cora saying earlier, you know, drones will save farmers time. They do because you're not out there doing things by hand um, as much as you would without the drone. So exactly. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank you for sharing with us today. I really appreciate you um, showing us this presentation and helping us build our own little robots. <laughs> yeah, well, great. Um, I hope they learned something today and uh, um, maybe we'll see them here on the Purdue campus in a couple of years. What grade are Absolutely. you guys in, Cora and Cordell? What grade are you going to I'm going to be a senior. Ah, you'll be a senior this year. What are your plans uh, next year? Do you know what you're doing yet? Or where? I uh, don't know yet. I have a few things I want to be, but just haven't figured it all out yet. Cool. How about you, Cora? What year are you? I'm in eighth grade. Eighth grade. All right. You got a few years yet. Are right, you uh, going into eighth, eighth grade this fall? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, excellent. Glad to have uh, both of you with us today. Anything else, Danielle? Nope, I don't think so. Um, I thought there would be another junior leader council member um, doing an activity, but they're not. So we are finished. Oh, okay. Excellent.